It seems today that a lot of people want to change the world, so long as it doesn't involve changing themselves. They'd like the world to act correctly, but they're not ready to live that way uh, for themselves. You know, the truth is our world isn't going to see any kind of meaningful change unless individuals confess their sin and turn to the Lord. And by the way, that's why the Lord didn't tell us to change our culture. He told us to make disciples. One disciple at a time can bring the light of truth to their dark world. You know, Ezra understood this principle in his day some 450 years before the church came into being. The Jewish nation needed to change, but it wasn't going to happen unless individuals confessed their sin. Now, while Ezra is dealing with a unique situation involving a covenant people, the people of Israel, we can find some timeless lessons here in chapters 9 and 10 for us today. Even before Ezra left Persia to return to Judah, he knew there were sin problems among his people. And now that he's in Jerusalem, he's informed of of one of them, and it's here in chapter 9 and verse 1. The officials approached me and said, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with their abominations. For they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the lands. Now, the issue here isn't ethnic or racial. It's spiritual. The Lord had forbidden intermarriage with unbelieving idolaters. Ezra cites God's prohibition later on here in verse 11. The land that you are entering to take possession of it is a land impure with the impurity of the peoples of the lands, with their abominations that have filled it. Therefore, do not give your daughters to their sons, neither take their daughters for your sons. That's exactly what they had started doing. In fact, even the Jewish leaders and officials were disobeying this clear command. Now, with this news, I want you to watch what Ezra does, and I want to point out through his actions four steps to take in correctly responding to sin, and this can apply to you and me today. The first step is anguish. Ezra immediately reacts to this news, and he writes here in verse 3, As soon as I heard this, I tore my garment and my cloak and pulled hair from my head and beard and sat appalled. A tearing Uh, The clothes was a a common expression of grief. Pulling out some of his hair expressed uh, distress. He's he's appalled by this sin. He's, He's horrified by what it means. Let me tell you, it's only when we become appalled and distressed and horrified over our sin that we're going to do anything about it. Now, verse 4 tells us here that other people also trembled at the words of the God of Israel. They're terrified of the judgment of God, and and frankly, they probably remembered that their recent captivity was the result of what? Idolatry and defiance against God. Well, this same evening, Ezra writes in in verse 5, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God. I want to call this second step in responding correctly to sin, admission. Ezra prays here in verse 6, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to you, my God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. (laughs) That's what I call admission of sin. See, Ezra understands that what makes their sin so horrible is that God had only recently shown them mercy by allowing them to survive and even return here to their land. But now look, they're gladly intermarrying with people who worship other gods, who practice all kinds of immorality in the name of their God. I want you to notice 
what Ezra acknowledges here now in, in verse 13. You have punished us less than our iniquities deserved. I know people who won't repent because they think God's too hard on them. But those who truly repent realize God hadn't been as hard on them as he could have been. Well, properly responding to sin not only involves anguish and admission, but it also leads to action. Ezra's prayer of confession is being offered now publicly before the temple. And in fact, verse 1 of chapter 10 reveals a lot of people here begin to weep. and They gather around Ezra and begin to lament over their sin. And one of them, a man by the name of Shechaniah, says to Ezra here in verse 2, We have broken faith with our God and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land. But even now there is hope for Israel in spite of this. By the way, that's pretty good theology. There's always hope for repentant sinners, no matter what they've done, if they confess their sin. Shechaniah goes on to suggest that the people need to make a covenant with God to put away their foreign wives. In other words, he's saying, you know, we ought to get serious about changing our lives. Now, I don't know much about Shechaniah, but he was a brave man for being willing to change his life and to even challenge other people to change theirs as well. Well, Ezra has the people take an oath that they will dissolve these marriages. Then after fasting through the night, Ezra, he issues a a proclamation calling everyone to assemble in Jerusalem. Three days later, when they come together in Jerusalem, it's, it's pouring rain. Ezra preaches out there in the open anyway, and he preaches, by the way, with great power. In his sermon, he says here in verse 11, Now then, make confession to the Lord, the God of your fathers, and do his will. Separate yourselves from the peoples of the land and from the foreign wives. Now, I want you to keep in mind this is a unique step specifically for the nation Israel during this unique time. This isn't advice for you today to go and divorce your unsaved husband or wife. There are passages in the New Testament that tell us what to do in cases like that today. And if you want to look ahead, by the way, you can read 1 Peter chapter 3, where the wife of an unbelieving husband is encouraged to respect him and win him with the gospel without even saying a word. We have a resource, by the way, called For Better or For Worse, based on that passage, if you'd like to contact us for more information. Well, the people of Israel here are convicted. They confess their sin. Then they change their lives, which, by the way, reflects true repentance. Now, this change isn't going to happen overnight. In fact, individual cases are going to have to be examined. After all, if a foreign spouse becomes a follower of the Lord, that marriage continues back here. I want you to remember Boaz, who married a former idolater, a Gentile woman named Ruth. Now, there's one more step needed in correctly responding to sin. We've talked about anguish, admission, action, There's one more, and I want to call this final step accountability. You see, the last half of chapter 10 is a list of men who had taken unbelieving, idolatrous wives. And let me tell you, this public listing of 113 Jewish men given here is going to be enough to hold them accountable. They're not going to want their name on this list for very long. Many of these men turned back to God in repentance. And so should we today, beloved. The truth is we all sin. The question is, how do we respond? Well, let's take these steps, perhaps even today, anguish, admission, action, accountability. And that returns us to walking in fellowship with God. Well, with that, we're out of time. Until next time, beloved, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.